Mastery is a concept that seems to drive a lot of reflex driven games and of course the fighting and speed run communities. In today's critical thought, I want to talk about how a game can facilitate the drive for mastery and what conditions need to be in place if you want the illustrious J grade for your game. Thanks to the rise of speedrunning and more esports related events over the past like 15 or so years, we've seen more games kind of embrace the idea of cultivating mastery in their titles. Now this is not the same as beating a game, and this is a major point. What we're talking about is going above and beyond what is considered the normal skill ceiling of a game. This is when we talk about doing 100% runs no hit runs and so on and while there are a lot of games that certainly have demanding games or demanding game loops that doesn't necessarily mean that they are there or they allow or set up to support mastery and there are very specific conditions that need to be in place for what we're going to talk about today the first is that the game must be reflex driven while mastery in this respect has a lot of analogs to playing a roguelike, a buying of Isaac, Spelunky, Dead Cells, whatever, where what you do 30 minutes in will be farther than how you play the game after 10 hours, 50 hours, 100 hours. And your knowledge of the game will greatly impact what you're able to do in it and your ability to play through and mitigate RNG. When we talk about mastery, we are referring to this act that the player themselves is getting better at the game. And reflex driven games, because of their high skill floor and high skill ceiling, are some of the best ways to show or let the player feel like they're getting better at it. When we talk about Souls Likes, that there is a major difference between how you play a Souls Like Minute 1, Hour 1, to where you're going to be at hour 50 and at the end of the game. And when we talk about abstracted based design, RPG, strategies, and so on, you don't get that same sense of mastery. Again, if your character is swinging a sword 50 times harder, that's not changing what you're doing at it. And abstracted based design is oftentimes more about kind of solving a puzzle as to how to make the mechanics work for you, how to break the game, rather than you yourself doing this all on your own. And that takes me to the second point. If you want mastery to work in your title or to create that atmosphere for it, the game must be set up to allow or accommodate multiple approaches to getting through the stages. Now, this is definitely something that most abstracted games cannot feasibly do, especially when we're talking about a largely linear design. But when we look at platformers, action games, and so on, at least the very best, they are set up to allow for different ways of playing. So if you're playing a game like Devil May Cry and you're consistently getting C's, D's, maybe a rare B, you're still making progress in the game. But if you're someone who can play it at triple A or triple S, A, S plus, uh, Dante must die mode, you're still playing through the game, but you're doing it very differently in that respect. And a lot of early platformers, despite, again, having the challenge of the gameplay, the levels themselves were not really set up to accommodate mastery. And we can look at this in kind of the early Mario games versus when we got to the 3D ones. In Super Mario World, 1, 2, 3, and so on, you can, as a skilled player, skip some of the jumps, skip some of the areas with a well-timed jump, bounce, and so on. But the path that you're going through is largely going to be the same, regardless if you are a novice, good, or a master at the game. The main difference, of course, is how fast you're actually going to play through it. If you're not good at Mario, you're going to have more deaths, you're going to move slower, be more cautious. If you're a master, you're just going to be jumping and bouncing and going as quickly as you can through it. Now when we got to the 3D Marios, especially starting from Galaxy and on, 
we began to see some more elements there to reward and incentivize mastery. And this actually will go to our third point. When you look at the very first stage of Super Mario Galaxy, there's a section that involves you having to jump across like very slow moving platforms that are going back and forth in a cycle. If you're new to the game, you'll do that very slowly. You'll walk up to a platform, jump, wait for it to line up, jump again, repeat. It's a little bit long in that respect. If you're better at the game, you'll just do kind of series of running jumps and just jump across each platform, it's faster. If you're a master, what you'll probably end up doing is taking that very risky gap that's over there into a running dash jump or running dive jump, completely skip that entire section, just move right along. Are any one of those paths considered the right one? No, they're all equally viable and all of them are going to be dependent on the player's skill. And this is again why mastery is very important or what makes mastery work. It is all about kind of the intrinsic reward of the player learning the game and feeling better at it, and then the game being set up to kind of incentivize the player to feel like, I should train, I should try and do things better, and see how much the game improves. And that takes me to the third and final point. In order to facilitate mastery, what you need to do is that the game not only must the level design, be sub to accommodate multiple play styles, so must the individual mechanics. And this is definitely something that when we again go back to reflex versus abstract design, that the best reflex design games or driven games can do this. So here's a great example of how you can tell the difference between a novice, a good, and a master or platformer designer. A novice platformer maker the jumping will usually be just like one kind of jump. It's kind of awkward to do. It doesn't quite feel right. And sometimes the rest of the game may kind of allow you to skirt not having a very precise or very fine-tuned jumping. We oftentimes see this in kind of, I guess, like story-driven platformers, sometimes puzzle platformers, that kind of thing. A good platformer designer will oftentimes have like one style of jump. Maybe there's some kind of like variable jumping. So you can kind of like jump and not go all the way up. But that one jump is going to feel good. The game is going to be balanced around it. You're not really being tested in terms of platforming mastery. As long as you can make that gap go from like here to there, you're good. Now a master platformer or a master platformer designer will have multiple ways of jumping. There are going to be different tech that you can use. A game like Celeste would be a good example in this respect. In Celeste, you can use a different dashing to create different jumping techniques that all will allow you to do very different things. Returning to the difference between 2D and 3D Mario, this is where we really saw this in Mario Odyssey and Mario Galaxies. In Mario Odyssey, you can do a standard jump, you can do a walking and running jump, but then you can do stuff like a side flip jump, back flip jump, running dive jump, ground pound jump extender, jump in the air, dive forward, bounce off of Cappy, bounce off Cappy into a wall jump, into a spin, into a flutter, to then do a ground pound and then bounce back up to do then another dive into a Cappy bounce, into a spin jump, into another Cappy, up to a wall. And if you do all that, you can probably shave off at least 20 seconds on your <laughs> personal record when you speed run the game. And with Super Mario Odyssey, again, this is a really great example of a game to study in terms of allowing for these very different tech when it comes to jumping and moving around. The levels are designed that if you're just a novice and you're going through the game kind of in order when new elements are introduced, you can play through it. If you know what you're doing, you can start breaking sequences and speeding through from the very first stage. And again, it's not about just setting up one true way of playing. As I said at the start, mastery is not the same as beating a game. If you set up your game to require mastery in order to win, then we're talking about like a Kaizo style game, one that has 
an even smaller and more nichier fan base than other titles. As you're kind of building this game around, you want to have these different mechanics and different tech. But there is another point about this that needs to be said. Any aspects of mastery, advanced tech, advanced elements that you can work in your routine, they must be referenced or inferred by the game itself. So if you have in your game that if a character does three 360s in a row, presses home and an asterisk on their keyboard, the character turns into a Super Saiyan and does 800% more damage. That's really great to know how many people are going to stumble across that as they play. And this is when we kind of get into some very light, like, emergent game design. A very classic, or I guess somewhat classic example of this, would be platformers where when you do an attack, it kind of lifts the character up very slightly. So it acts as almost like a pseudo double jump. And I've seen some games will do this. Some of them will implicitly kind of lay that out. Like, hey, you're jumping and you're slashing, so the character go up. So your brain can put one and one together. Other games will just literally say, hey, in order to do a double jump, jump and attack while you're in the air, and it'll carry you up. And you want to allow, or you want to kind of teach these things to the player, especially if you're introducing a new tech or a new element that must be folded into the routine of the game. Returning to Celeste, you have, from the very beginning of that game, from minute one, second one of playing it, you can do this kind of like wave dash, where you jump, dash diagonally to the ground, and then jump to kind of launch yourself in a direction. Now, the majority of the base game, or side A, you are never going to need to do that. You can do it if you want, you can sequence break if you want, but it's not required. If I remember right, it's actually formally introduced when you get to either the end of side A or the final challenge in side B. My memory's a little hazy on that respect. But again, this is one of those examples where a advanced tech is formally introduced and then the player can start thinking about in the back of their mind, wait, if I can do that, couldn't I do that over here? Or maybe in this section? And then suddenly, their entire way of playing the game changes. When I was watching people play Ultra Kill, as an example, I noticed that they were kept doing this like weird explosion attack with their shotgun. I was like, wait, how are they doing that? And then I noticed that they were using the punch parry to punch the shotgun shells to turn it into a parry counter and do increased damage. I was just sitting there going, wait, you can do that? And I don't know in the game if it actually ever infers or explains that you're able to do that with your own shots. But as I've said, when it comes to mastery, the player needs to be given kind of like the guiding direction that there is more to it. You don't have to explicitly tell the player, okay, do a triple jump spin over here and you'll skip this entire section. But you want to introduce to the player that, hey, you have a spin jump, you have a triple jump. If you do this ground pound, you, do, you have increased jumping. And then you want to kind of lay these pieces out and let the player put it all together. What you don't want to do is hide something that is crucial for mastery, something that the player would not stumble upon otherwise. And then maybe in like a tutorial message somewhere, like 20 hours in, the game would say, oh, by the way, do you know you can do a spin here and completely avoid all damage? To wrap things up, a really great example of a game that I play lately would be Pizza Tower. Pizza Tower in of itself is a hard game to play. For a lot of people who've tried it, you either will get it very quickly, or you are going to be in for a world of pizza pain, trying to learn the different movement tech and mechanics of it. And it is a game that is definitely set up to reward mastery and incentivize that. You have S ranks, you have P ranks, the game charts all your achievements. And when we talk about like why or the motivation of mastering a game, it's about being able to play a game fundamentally different and better as you learn it. 
The first time I did a P-Rank in Pizza Tower, it took me a long time. This was just on the very first stage. It took me longer to P-Rank the first level of Pizza Tower than it did for me to P-Rank the uh, final level that I did. And if you do things right, you too can have something like this happen on stream. Thirty-three seconds. Twenty-three. Done. Woo! And that is one hundred percent. Give me all those clothes. And the best part about Pizza Tower, compared to some of the other games that I've played, is that mastery is not 100% perfection. You can mess up. You can accidentally not get that perfect topping, or you may have to do a safety move in order to keep your combo up. Contrast that to something like Crash Bandicoot 4 that mentally and physically broke me, trying to get 100% in that one, where it just felt like Mastery was pain. That it was more about jumping through the hoops of the game rather than feeling like I'm growing and I'm mastering these mechanics and I'm able to play through the game differently. And that's kind of like the final, final point about why mastery can be so alluring in the challenge of building around it. That you want the player to feel like there is a different way of playing it, not a correct way, not the true way, but a different way, and that the game is set up to accommodate and incentivize that if someone wants to do that. Again, there is no shame in beating Pizza Tower without S-ranking or P-ranking the entire game. If you can beat the game, you know, good show for you. But the kind of carrot is dangling on the stick for players. And the game is set up to encourage you and give you that little push if you want to do it. And again, I cannot stress this enough. Mastery is not about a required way of playing. If someone wants to 100% Pizza Tower or, heaven forbid, 100% Crash Bandicoot 4, they can do that. But the game has an intended endpoint long before that. And it's, again, why we don't see too many games built around this. This is, again, expert and grandmaster content. But the reason why it's so alluring is that if someone plays through your game and realizes, hmm, there's, you know, I'm only like 50% done, there's all these challenges over here, maybe I can try a few here and there. And if they leave the game, let's say they only get 70%. 80%. They're not 100%ing the game, but they at least tried it and they enjoyed it. They're going to leave that game with a far more positive impression, rather than leaving the game and they just got crushed and they had no idea what they were doing. And, again, good pacing is an essential aspect of mastery. You do not want your first level to just say, okay, for the tutorial, master every single mechanic in the next five minutes. And it takes expert level comma level design in order to facilitate that again with pizza tower the very first stage in the grand scheme of things of the rest of the game is a very simple level to learn compared to the final level but if you're learning this for the first time you're still not sure how all the tech works it's going to feel like a ginormous gauntlet to go through once you've done it a few times once you start doing the other levels it can become like second nature that you can do it in your sleep. And when players can feel that, they are more motivated to keep playing and they'll keep supporting games that do this. And with that, for my, I guess, wrap up question for you watching, can you think of good examples of games that reward and incentivize mastery? Can you even think of abstracted games? Is there a game that rewards you with the heart of the cards? for being a master duelist or a master Pokemon trainer. Let me know in the comments down below. Do all the YouTubing stuff people tell you to do. If you're interested in my thoughts on design, be sure to pick up any of my game design books or wherever books are sold. 
visit our Discord and Patreon and come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where some of the art and science of games.